we were driving here, but but we'll we'll agree hit on all that kind of stuff here. So our, our uh, wonderful host today is the great Dr. Seth Riley. So he is uh, he'll he'll tell us his story and the cool research they're doing. But part of a uh, so some of our protected area, some of our national park units uh, are focused mostly on history uh, and, and cultural resources. Some of them are focused on biological resources and and, and protecting things. Um, not all of our park units have a really robust research arm or a really robust monitoring effort. Um, here in the Santa Monicas, they do. And so the, this is his purview, and this is the, the jam that he runs. He'll tell us about that. But we're, we're very blessed, we're very fortunate that we have, um, we have historic investments, and we have continued investments, both in Channel Islands, where our research station is, and here. And that is not the norm. So I just want to, uh, sometimes we get used to thinking that all things are this way. The other thing that's really cool is you guys have uh, two great examples of um, the sort of extremes of, of the types of national parks that exist uh, in the world. Uh, we haven't talked specifically about the different categories of protected areas yet, but, but we will. You're starting to read some of that this week. But, but um, the basically, the Channel Islands are the, is the classic old style, which is no people around, far away, and we just set this aside, and, and people are sort of a, an app, and not exactly an afterthought, but, but, but they're, they're not, not the original main focus, right? We're gonna preserve this biodiversity. Santa Monica's are much more like most of the national parks in most of the world, right? Which is people have been, people have, have lived, worked, um, existed in these landscapes for a long time before the ideas of protected areas come into being, right? And, um, and so, so we already had cities and, and roads and all this infrastructure already in here. And so we've assembled the protection around the existing features of stuff, right? So rather than one big giant Yellowstone or one big giant Yosemite type of approach, here in the Santa Monica's, we, we have a chunk here, a chunk there, a chunk here, a chunk there. And so it's much more like the vast majority of protection across the vast majority of the world. So here, right where campus line, where, where our two campus components lie, is a fantastic example of the range of the types of protected area. Um, and with that, I, uh, I, I'll introduce uh, uh, Seth. So Seth is both, and so primarily he's a National Park Service employee. He's, he's gonna speak today, but he also is an adjunct professor at UCLA, who does lots of research. He does a lot of work with student groups and things of that nature, and so, um, and so I'll turn it over to Seth. Um, awesome, all right, thank you, Sean. And Adam, yeah. And yeah, that was a good, I think of our project as being weird, like because it's true relative to the U.S. it is, but I, that's interesting that your perspective about lots of parks around the world is actually not that unusual. Yeah, but that's cool. So yeah, um, yeah. So as Sean said, I work for the National Park Service. I'm also an adjunct at UCLA, um, and I'm, well, I guess I don't know if you sort of talked about the plan generally. But, so we're going to talk here for 45 minutes, an hour or so, um, and then we're going to go over to the crossing um, that, um, that you all passed on the way here, which I'll talk about a little bit today too, uh, so you can see what that looks like. We'll hike up the hill a little bit so you can get a good view of it, uh, and we can answer questions and, and talk about other stuff there. So is that That's good. What you're thinking That's perfect. That? So, okay. Um, all right. Well, so I'll just get started here because I have... Uh, a lot to say, I'm gonna to try to sort of go through quite a bit um, fairly quickly, but then we can also have questions at the end of this too, depending, I guess, do you have a thought about when we wanna leave here? Mm, you know, when about an hour, about an hour. From, probably 10. From Liberty. Probably 10, 10, 10. No, I mean from, or, 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 sorry, uh, probably 11. 11. Probably 11, 11, because it's about a half hour drive to school-ish, so, yeah. so 11, if we left 11, 15, then we could still go back to class on time okay. for. all right, so yeah. 11, 11, 15, okay, yeah. sounds good. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk about what it's like to try to conserve wildlife in the second largest metropolitan area in the country, in Los Angeles, uh, and so a bunch of different challenges that we have trying to do that here, and then at the end, um, talk a little bit about some some successes, so that it's not it's not so that it's not all bad news. <laughs> um, and then, so I don't know if you've talked about this. Sean and all about the California Floristic Province and just general. So we're in California. We are one of 34 biodiversity hotspots across the planet. 
So a lot of really great biodiversity, but less than 30% of that California floristic province is remaining as protected. Um, and we're also in one of five Mediterranean ecosystems. I don't know if you've talked about that at all, but it's a really unique, there's a few, a few well, five places around the world. So on the west coast of Central America, in the Mediterranean, of course, in South Africa, in Australia, and then in California. So it's a pretty interesting, unique system that way. Uh, and there are places, so this is up at the top, this is at Sandstone Peak in the Santa Monica Mountains. If you've never been there, it's a pretty awesome spot. And um, so there are beautiful places in the Santa Monica's like this where you can, it feels like you're far away from humans and development. And as I said, we have an amazing amount of biodiversity in the Santa Monica Mountains, which is, which is really fortunate. And so this is, this is at the west end of the Santa Monica. It's actually just a little bit north of, yep. of, of Cal State, of you all. And this is, a, this is where we took the president when he came to visit. And like, this is a place, again, where you could, where you far from uh, development and urbanization. But then there are places like this. So this is in the Simi Hills. Uh, this is sort of near Canaan Road here, where you have intense development, little bits of natural open space remaining, but then more development on the other side. Um, there's a bunch of <coughs> Caneo open space properties there in the CB Hills, and so that's a much more challenging environment. So we have all of that in the Santa Monica. So here's the Santa Monica Mountains, the Los Angeles Basin down here, San Fernando Valley. And you can see that the Santa Monica's are, and we'll talk about this more, but completely cut off by the 101 freeway from everything to the north. And then you have intense development all around. And then like this is some of those areas that I was showing in the Simi Hills where you have <coughs> intense fragmentation where little bits of open space remaining that are surrounded by roads and development. Um, and he's doing through. So I'm gonna talk about a few different challenges. Um, and to sort of give an example from the work that we've done. So one is just when urban areas are built, you completely remove habitat uh, and you completely trans transform it. Um, when you have urbanization and together, well, it can happen just with urbanization, but also with roads, you have habitat fragmentation, uh, which sounds like you've talked about a little bit, where, again, you have these little remaining bits of habitat. This is actually in the Thousand Oaks area, that's still a big hill. Or Rancho Simi Patch here, you have little bits of habitat remaining that are surrounded by roads and development, so fragmentation is another challenge. Um, that's just going a little fast. And then the other thing <clears throat> that you can have with roads and development is the lack, the loss of connectivity. So before people were here building all these things, this was all one big natural landscape. These roads weren't here, the development wasn't here, and so animals could move back and forth freely between all these natural areas, um, and now that's much less the case. And so that's, a, that's another major challenge that we see. And then <clears throat> we also see an issue with when you have development right next to natural areas, what are the impacts um, of being right near people and, and buildings and that kind of thing? And so you can have what we call encroachment and exposure to things like toxicants, and so that's something I'll talk about too. Um, and then the final challenge is, I don't know if you've all well, talked about fire. Not, um, not in this class so yeah. much. Um, so the other thing that goes along with urbanization and roads and people is regular, much more, much more frequent than they would be naturally, fires and often really big fires. And so I'll talk a little bit about, in the end, about the Wolsey fire um, that we had in, in 2018. Okay, so <clears throat> we talked a little bit uh, first about amphibians and actually Sean mentioned that we do a lot of mo we do research and we do monitoring here the National Park Service actually has long-term monitoring program throughout all the national parks and what happens is you eat there's clusters of parks our cluster is us Channel Islands and Cabrillo National Monument and we pick certain things to monitor you can't monitor everything but we pick what we call vital signs of ecosystem health and the goal is to monitor those forever so one of those is amphibians. So actually, we're just about to start this, like this week or next week. Every spring, we go out and um, get to hang out in the stream and count, count tadpoles, basically. Um, so that's fun. But we also we count adult frogs and newts, and then we also look for invasive species like that crayfish, actually. Uh, and invasive, that's sort of a major problem in the stream. So this is a challenge of urbanization when you have loss and transformation of habitat in the watersheds. Basically what we do is we 
this is a survey spot for a particular watershed, and we just say, how much development is there upstream of that survey spot in this watershed? So in this spot, this is an Aurora Ski in the, in the far western end of the mountains. There's almost no development within that watershed. But then there's a couple of other spots in the Simi Hills here. So there's a survey spot, there's a survey spot, there's a survey spot down there. And these are those watersheds, and there's a lot of development within those watersheds. And interestingly, this one is down by Paramount Ranch, which is a national park site. Um, and so it looks very natural there, but if you look at the watershed, there's a lot of development within it, and so that can definitely um, have an effect, as I'll mention. Um, so here's the, the whole story in the, what's that? There's a mule deer. Oh, cool. Does it have a collar on? We're actually tracking some. Uh, it's right out the door. So, <laughs> so actually, I'm not going to talk about it today, but we're starting to do some studies and stuff. <laughs> Of meal deer. Sorry, I was talking too loud for the deer. <laughs> That's cool. Good, uh, good spotting there. I've seen two deer during the class. Dude, you are the deer spotter. <laughs> right, the spotter. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so the, the story here is basically urbanization. Maybe not surprisingly, it's not good for speeds. And you don't even have to have all that much. What we found is as little as 8% of development within the watershed upstream of that point that we sample significantly alters the stream and biodiversity. Um, so we, we characterize the streams by going along and looking at each what we call habitat piece or a stop, and we call it a run, which is <clears throat> long and sort of where more fast moving, a riffle, which is shallower, and so you can imagine it riffling, and then a pool, which is wider and deeper. And so we characterize the habitat and how diverse it is. Um, and then we count, like I said, we count the species, um, and we see two things. One is in terms of what the streams look like, they're significantly less diverse in these more urban streams. Um, so here's a couple of natural streams. So this is just a cartoon, but you can see it's like pool, riffle, pool, riffle, pool, riffle, run, riffle. So a lot of diversity, whereas in these urban streams, we have these long stretches of run, so much less diversity, and this is actually in Malibu Canyon here, and just not far down the road, and you can see it's this long, um, deep stretch of a run, and part of that is because you get a lot of runoff in urban areas that ends up in the streams. The other thing that that does is it makes the streams significantly more permanent than they would be, so in, a, in our Mediterranean system, frequently streams dry up every year, um, but if they're more permanent, then that's an issue with some of these invasive species. And so what we see is, for the native species, they're much more common in the natural streams, so the blue bars here are natural versus urban. Um, so here's California newts and California tree frogs. Rarely find them in the urban streams, but we find them commonly in the natural streams. And then the exact opposite pattern in, with the invasive species. So this <coughs> red swamp crayfish comes from the southeast, uh, and it's used for fish bait, and it ends up in the streams. And they basically just like eat everything. Um, the amphibians and the other invertebrates and the plants and like, so they're really bad for the rest of the diversity. And then we have a bunch of fish species that are not native as well. Um, and both of those things need permanent water, so they're more common in these urban streams. Uh, this is just a cool example, of, well, a cool, I mean, unfortunate, <laughs> but interesting example. Um, so this is actually a stream that we study um, in the Simi Hills. So it's called Lang Creek, uh, and at the top of it, which is up in, in the, um, I guess it's not, we don't own that technically, but it's one of the preserved areas. It's like our only stream in the Simi Hills that still has newts, and it's a, it's a great stream. But then it comes down into Thousand Oaks here, and it's very urban, and so we also survey it right here by Old Meadows Park, um, and typically we we don't have many amphibians there, but we did have the Pacific tree frog, which is a super common widespread species that you still find all over the place. Um, and this is the, the number of tadpoles uh, per meter here. Um, and you can see that you know, there can be a lot of variation sometimes with amphibians, but we were consistently finding Pacific tree frogs every year from the beginning in 2000 to 2010. Um, and then we just have never seen them since 2010. And there's tons of crayfish in that um, stream and it's just a um, it's a very urban stream and 
it looks like basically that species is no longer there, unfortunately. So, yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, it might be. Do you mind if we do questions sure. at the end? Just go. I'm just gonna try to. But yeah, hold up. Uh, hold on to those and remember them. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have. We have. Yeah, we have enough. <laughs> yeah, go, yeah, go for it. Chair is still okay. Good. Um, anyway, so yeah, so just an interesting. And this is one of the things you can that you can see with long-term monitoring, right? We've been monitoring for 20 years, and so you can see in this case, unfortunately, where a species has been lost from a particular area, which is unfortunate. Um, so then we've also been doing terrestrial reptile and amphibian monitoring. Uh, so these are our sites, actually, all across the Santa Monicas and the Simi Hills. Uh, again, this is part of our long-term monitoring project. Uh, basically, just to, so you know how this works, is we have these pitfall trap arrays that we put out uh, various places. They have this drift fencing. The animals come along, they hit the fence, they go, they go left or right, and then they, they run across the pitfall and they fall into the pitfall like this alligator lizard or that whiptail lizard. And then we come along and count them and mark them and then, and then release them. Um, and so good news in terms of this situation is that so it's a, it's a very diverse place here in Southern California. Reptiles like you know hot, dry, Areas we have, this is our species list for the park in terms of reptiles and amphibians, and it's a pretty long list. Um, and the good news is that we basically have all the species that we should have based on range maps, etc., in the park, which is, which is cool. Um, there are 34 native species, and there's 25 of them which are relatively terrestrial and ones that we would probably be able to detect with our pitfall traps. Um, and in the first like nine years of that work, we detected 24 of those 25 species. Um, the only one that we didn't detect was the liar snake. Uh, but liar snakes like pretty rocky areas where it's pretty hard to dig a pitfall trap. Um, and so that might be part of that. And we have, through incidental observations, we know that liar snakes are still around. Um, this is just an excuse to show I've originally <laughs> like a her person from when I was 10 and got and fell in love with snakes, so I like to show her to this cool her picture. Um, anyway, that's horned lizard and a patch nose snake and an arboreal lizard, just, I mean, an arboreal salamander, just some of the diversity, and satina, uh, night snake, and California mountain king snake, which is a super cool species, but unfortunately, partly because it's so cool, it gets collected a lot, so. Anyway, so lots of species, which is great, but what about um, some of, what have we seen in terms of Impacts of things. So, in terms of the terrestrial herbs, specifically, we've, we've looked at habitat fragmentation and how that affects this community. Uh, and so, we have these pitfall trap arrays. I mean, as you saw, we had them. We had them throughout the Santa Monica's and the Simi Hills. But especially early on in the study, we had them in a, a number of different places. So, this is in the Simi Hills here. We had them in some of these very small little habitat patches, and then we had them in these larger patches, and then we had them in these more large core areas. Um, at least from the perspective of a, that wouldn't be a core area for a mountain lion, but it is, uh, it is for a reptile. And basically what we've seen is, in some of these small patches, we're completely losing some species. So we don't have larger snakes, like rattlesnakes and striped racers. We get them in the large patches and in the core areas, and we just don't get them anymore in the small patches. There are some species that we still have across the landscape, like western fence lizards, which Species probably, you know, many of you have seen before. They're pretty common. I just uh, saw one on Sunday when I was birding. Um, and so, but overall, uh, like I said, we, we have significantly reduced diversity in these small patches relative to the large patches and in the core areas. And, you know, maybe you'll talk about this kind of thing with um, protected area theory. But <clears throat> so this is a common, a common pattern that you see is fewer species in smaller parks. Um, so here's the smaller parks, the, and the larger, the large fragments actually for these, for this community are pretty similar to the core areas. So one thing I think I didn't um, include the, the slide in this talk, but I'll just mention it quickly. It doesn't mean that these small areas aren't still valuable for conservation, they totally are. And actually if you add up all the diversity from those small patches, uh, you get a similar number up there, and it's, a, it's actually a, a smaller, similar or even smaller amount of protected open space. So, you know, if you protect a bunch of these smaller areas, you can still get value. Um, but in general, a small patch is not going to give you as many species, you know, as these larger patches, especially in fragmented areas.